So we've been talking about friends of God, and uh, when Dylan threw out this uh, series to me, I asked him a while back, I said, hey, I'm you know, going to be taking off a little bit for the summer, why don't you uh, plan a series? And so he came up with this idea, and um, I got really excited because uh, when you start talking about uh, friendship with God, I mean, there's like, there's so many, there's, there's so much material, there's literally a whole book of material that you can draw from. Um, and uh, so much of uh, scripture is really about people who are intimately aware and intimately connected with God. And um, just outside of, you know, like you can just focus on the gospels. Man, you can drive this thing for hundreds of weeks. Um, but when you go out to the whole Bible, you can go thousands of weeks. Um, I don't have any intention to go thousands of weeks, but um, I could. But uh, when he, he thought about it, I was like, okay, so like, okay, when, you know, I get back from vacation, what am I going to do? Um, and immediately I thought, oh, yes, you know, okay, let's, let's go outside of the traditional disciples, you know, and start looking at people who are within the gospel narrative, but uh, not traditionally known as gospel, you know, or disciples. And uh, so my, my first thought went to Mary and Martha, and uh, I started thinking like, oh yeah, I'm so excited to preach this message. Uh, and then, okay, well, what are you going to do next? Is I'm going I'm to do Moses. Moses would be a great guy to talk about. And uh, then a couple weeks ago, I get on uh, the internet and I start like, okay, well, I better catch up and see where Dylan's at because I don't want to, you know, unteach anything that Dylan has taught. Um, you know, I mean, that's just very important. Uh, so I watched the first message and like, dude, you took my topic, Mary and Martha. Like, come, come on, man. Like, throw me a bone. And then I thought, okay, all right. Um, I can't talk about that because, I, man, I, just, I love that story. People have that whole thing so confused because um, they, anyway, man. go back and watch Dylan's message. Um, he did a great job covering that material. Um, and then, uh, you know, then I thought, oh, okay, well, all right, I, I can go to Moses. And so then I watched the second, you know, session of this series, and he talk, talks about Moses. And I'm like, oh, man, <sighs> what am I going to do? All right. So um, today we're going to talk about Abraham. Um, interestingly enough, Abraham is the one guy in the Bible that is actually, like, named as a friend of God. And we're going to talk about why he was specifically named. Now, Jesus, in John chapter 15, he says all of us, as his disciples, are his friends. And uh, as his friends, you know, we, he no longer calls us servant because, as he says, a servant doesn't know what the master is doing. He doesn't know the master's business. But now I call you friends, which means not only do you know the master's business, but you know the master's heart behind the business. You're his friend. And that's what friendship really means. Like, and you think about your friends that you have. Why are you friends with the people that you're friends with? You ever, I mean, please tell me you thought about that. Like, you know, and like, have you, do you have a friend that you've, you know so well that when it comes to a certain, like when somebody says a certain thing or does a certain thing, you just immediately know how they're going to respond? That's what, that's what Jesus is talking about. That type, of, that type of friendship, that level of friendship that when, when you think about, I, uh, I have friends like this. Actually, uh, one of the best friends that I've had since middle school is uh, our business manager, Josh. You know him as Josh. Um, one, of, one of the things that I so love about having Josh around is that uh, if I'm not here and somebody asks a question about like, hey, what was, what was Caleb going to think about this? Josh, Josh knows 99.9% .9 of the time what it is that I'm going to say, how I'm going to, to inflect the tone of my voice, and um, the reason why I would answer the question the way that I answer it. That's... That's the, the, that's the thing that friends do, right? They just, they just know their friend. And Jesus says, you as my disciples are now my friend. So not only, not only do you know what I'm, what I'm about, but you know why I'm about what I'm about. And as my friends, you, when asked, what's your master about, you can answer this is what my friend is going to do in this situation. 
That's friendship with God. Uh, But Abraham, back to Abraham. Abraham, as Isaiah 41 says, um, the prophet says God calls Abraham his friend. That before Jesus was ever, I mean, the prophet is writing and, you know, speaking about Jesus, the the coming suffering servant. Um, Before, long before Jesus kind of shows up, God is already calling somebody within the, the scriptural narrative friend, which goes way beyond sort of where Israel was at at the time. And it presented a whole new paradigm for them because within the, the context of Isaiah, like the, um, God, God was in the temple. The temple was the holy sacred space. That was God's space. And only a, a, a select few people could go in there at any time, you know, a few times a year and they would, you know, do their offering and they would, you know, burn the incense and they would sprinkle the blood on the altar and they would, they would do all of that stuff in the Holy of Holies. But to, to them, that, that close, intimate access with God was only reserved for a few people. A handful. But yet, Abraham gets to be called a friend of God, which actually goes a step beyond just the priestly function. Because there was the high priests and then there was the priests and they did all of the temple worship things and they got to go into the intimacy sort of thing. But to be called God's friend was a much different view of of a relationship with God. And Abraham gets to be called his friend. Um, Some interesting things about Abraham. We know Abraham, right? God... God told um, Abraham, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you into a great nation. Uh, and we know that that promise was fulfilled because uh, you go anywhere around the world and you start talking about uh, Abraham. Uh, most people, you know, especially in the context of religion, most people know, like most of the world's population knows who Abraham is, right? Everybody in this room, you know who Abraham is, right? Yeah, yeah, say yeah, like, even if you're like, this is your first time in church, you're like, yeah, I, I know who Abraham, I've heard of him. Um, and if you've been in church a long time, uh, you probably heard the song, Father Abraham, right? And who's heard the song, Father Abraham, right? Uh, we know, can we sing it? Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had father. Where's Scott at today? He's, I'm singing and like, he would love this. Um, the, yeah, I saw you're still going. I went to seminary and then I learned that uh, Father Abraham, that song is wrong, actually. Father Abraham didn't have many sons. Father Abraham only had a few sons. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. But Father Abraham became the father of a great nation because God told him that he would be the father of a great nation. Um, When we think about uh, the early history of Israel and especially the book of Genesis, uh, there's some key figures in there, right? You think of Noah and you think of Adam and Eve and there's Abraham and then there's Isaac and then there's Jacob and then there's Jacob's sons, uh, there's Joseph. You think about all these people, if, if you're not, not kind of cautious of the whole narrative, one of the things that you can kind of believe is that these were like perfect people, But the truth about Abraham is Abraham was very far from perfect. Actually, it's one of the things I really love about the the history of of Israel. And this is, you know, in the biblical context, this is the the early history, the patriarchal history of Israel. Uh, What you see is a, a series of characters throughout a narrative that are deeply flawed people. They're deeply flawed. Abraham had a lot of flaws, his kids had a lot of flaws. Um, they were far from per- perfect. Noah, even Noah, who was, you know, sort of like kind of a grandfather in a way of Abraham, uh, or great-grandfather, he had a lot of flaws. I mean, this is a guy that was considered, he was the only righteous person in the land. And God says, hey, build, him a, build me a boat. To, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cleanse the earth. And you're going you're gonna to carry on... Uh, Humanity, you're going to be the seed of humanity, but you're the only righteous one. And so he gets on the boat that he builds, and off the boat, uh, 
Some time passes, he plants a vineyard, and he gets, I mean, he, he's, he's a drunkard. Like, that's the very next thing that you see in the, the, the story. Is like, he's just like, he's smashed. He's drunk and passed out naked in his tent. I mean, it's like wild. So, when you look at the early history of Israel, this is what you, you see. But here's some, some truth about Abraham, okay? Abraham, just so you know, he goes to some extreme lengths to ensure that he and his life has a favorable outcome. You can say it another way. Abraham was a self-centered person as a self-centered person comes. When you look at there, Abraham, this is, this is what you see. First, in Genesis chapter 12, he goes, um, it's funny because the Lord says, hey, Abraham, I want you to go to the, a land that I'm going to show you. I want you to leave your father's house, who Joshua later says was an idol worshiper. Um, he says, hey, I want you to go to this land that I'm going to show you, and I'm going to give it to your descendants. Um, and so he goes there, and the Lord, you know, I mean, you need to know this. The Lord doesn't send us a place and then never provides for us. Uh, so he gets to, to the land of Canaan and he starts looking around and he, he pitches a tent and then there's a famine. And so then, you know, what he does is he goes to Egypt. And what's interesting is that the Lord never told him to go to Egypt. He just went to Egypt. He's like, okay, I got, I got it. So number one, disobedient. Then he gets to Egypt, and his wife, Sarah, who's a very beautiful woman, uh, he's like a little like, I don't know how we're going to be received here. And so he starts telling people, hey, this is my sister. Which isn't really actually a full lie. It's like a, a half lie. He didn't say that she was his wife. Uh, he said, this is my sister, which actually technically, if you look at the kind of the lineage, that's a... That's not an untrue statement. They're half sister, brother sort of situation. Um, it's dysfunctional. Uh, so, and this is from a biblical scholarship perspective, just so you know, that's technical. Like, that, anyway, uh, so they get, to, they get there, and then he's like, he's, li he's lying to the Egyptians, and then she ends up in, in uh, the harem of Pharaoh, and then these, you know, this plague comes upon them, and you know, Pharaoh's like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? And then, of course, they get expelled because it's found out that she's not really his sister, but his wife, and like, wait a second, you've caused a curse to come upon us. And so they're sent from Egypt. Um, then, you know, uh, the Lord says, hey, look, I'm gonna give you a son, and um, he's going to be the, the, the daughter of, of Sarah. Um, and so some time passes and he, you know, he and Sarah begin to doubt like God, like in this whole thing, like it's like he said this, but this isn't really happening. Like 20 years have gone by and we still don't have a child. So um, Sarah proposes like, hey, what happens if you take my, if you take my, my servant, my maid servant, Hagar, marry her and have a son with her? And Abraham goes, yeah, great idea, let's do it. So he does that, he's a doubter. So not only is he a liar, he's a doubter. And then sometime later, uh, when they're, uh, they, they find this guy, Abimelech, and Abimelech is a, is a very wealthy king. And uh, because it worked out for Abraham the first time, he does it again. He's a little concerned that Sarah is going to be, you know, because of her beauty, is going to be taken over by Abimelech. And so, um, and, and there, he's concerned that he's going to be killed and Sarah is going to be taken from him uh, after his death. And so he lies again and tells Abimelech, hey, um, this is my sister. Leaves it at that, you know, no wife thing. Um, which I, the whole time reading this, like, well, I wonder what Sarah thinks about being called his sister. Um, probably, probably not, but not like that very much. But um, so he tries it again, and guess what it happens? It doesn't work. It doesn't work again. Uh, and this time, Abimelech says, "Look, you've caused a curse to come upon me. Go away from me. 
get away as far away from me as you possibly can. Uh, here is a is a is a, is a whole mountain of flock of, of 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 goats and sheep and camels, all this stuff. Just take it and go. And uh, then he goes, and then of course he meets Melchizedek, and Melchizedek um, is. Uh, king of righteousness and he gives him an offering and then he encounters God and God talks to him about um, having a son. Hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you into a great nation. And that was after he had already sent the son that he had with Ish- or Hagar, his son Ishmael, he sent him away and disowned him. So he's a liar, he's a doubter, he's a liar again, he disowns his own son. Um, and then, of course, when you read you know, the rest of Genesis, you start, you start looking at his, his descendants. And his descendants are just the same way. They're, they're liars and they're, they're thieves and they're cheats and they're, they're stealers and deceivers. And they're selling their, their brothers into to slavery. This is the, this is the, the early story. But yet Abraham, who's the father of this sort of dysfunctional family, uh, is called a friend. Why? Why is he called a friend? Well, one of the, I'll tell you this, just kind of close this out. The wonderful thing about this, this whole narrative is that within the context of this narrative, what you see is a series of divine reversals. What you see is a group of, of people who are just very, very dysfunctional in their, their, their activity that as they, as they go along, like they, they have these encounters with God where one of the things that you know them for in a previous chapter completely vanishes after they begin to encounter God. And what's, what's so neat about their, their story is that they go through a series of personal transformations where they, they actually grow as people. Abraham, throughout his life, actually grows to become a, a great father of a great nation. He grows. He, he actually, he learns his lesson, like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that. And then his kids, his kids learn. Isaac, not a whole lot said about Isaac, but when you, get to, when you get to Jacob, Jacob, Jacob's a swindler. He's stealing from his own brother. And his, his brother Esau vows to kill him. Like, I'm going to kill my brother is what he says. And then several chapters later, one of the things that you see is that uh, the two brothers reconcile. Esau, who was trying to, to swindle and get as much as a he possibly could of as wealth from as many people as he possibly could get it from. One of the things that you see is that he's giving all of his wealth to his brother. And then his brother shows up and, and, and Jacob is like expecting to be assaulted by his brother. The whole narrative is like set up like he is expecting to be assaulted by his brother and Esau arrives and embraces him. It says he hugs his neck, he grabs his neck, he, he kisses him which is a, an affection thing. And, and the, where you expect Esau to have all of like 30 years of, of angst and anger and, and just bitterness and rage, all of that just goes away. It just vanishes. And what you see is that God has been working on Esau and God has been working on Jacob. And you get to Jacob's sons, you know, J- Judah sells, sells Joseph into slavery. Right? He says, I can't stand this little kid, this little runt who my father loves. I'm, let's get rid of him. And so he gets with all of the rest of his brothers and they, they sell Joseph off into slavery and Joseph goes off. And then later on, when, when Joseph is in the position of power and the role has kind of reversed, he, he plays this trick on his brothers and by hiding uh, silver in their saddlebags. He hides it under Benjamin. And the punishment, the punishment for, for stealing the silver from the king's house was that Benjamin was going to die. And so in one scene early on, what you see is Ju- Judah like selling his brother off into slavery and saying, yeah, I wish him to be dead. And then way at the end of the story, you see another reversal where Joseph or Judah throws his life in front of Benjamin's. This is the transformation that you see. 
Right? So this is like, a, you, you see God throughout the whole Genesis narrative taking a dysfunctional group of people and making them functional. Um, Abraham, so why was, why was Abraham a friend of God? Um, Genesis 22, are you there? Yeah? Okay. This is Abraham's divine reversal. This is where everything that you sort of see about you know, Abraham's flaws just all kind of come to a head and like it all vanishes. It all disappears from the narrative. And what you see is a completely different um, Abraham. So in verse 3 of verse 22, and start there, it says, Sometime later, it says, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied. Then God said, do this, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain and I, that I will show you. Okay, pause. Does that seem like an odd request? Yes. This seems like an odd request. This is um, fairly grotesque, actually. If you, if you took this, this passage tore it from the page of your Bible and set it aside and say, you know what, this is, this is going to be my whole assessment. This is the thing that I'm going to assess. And people do this. They look at, the, they look at Genesis 22 as, a, as kind of an assessment of Christianity as a whole and say, how could God, how could God ask Abraham to sacrifice his only son? Isn't that like, that grotesque? Yeah. But if you... If you take that page and you just sort of judge Christianity and judge, you know, the whole, you know, Judaism even off of that, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to come up with a, a very flawed opinion. But when you begin to put that page back in your Bible and read it with the rest of the context, one of the things that you begin to discover is that God throughout the narrative up to this point has had his hand on every possible outcome where it's like there could be like I mean he's gonna flood the earth like what's gonna happen there like why flood the earth you know people ask these questions like oh, why flood the earth and what you know what's like but when, but when you see it within the context of the whole one of the things that you see is that that God is working in these these situations to provide a favorable outcome for this the people in the story that's the that's how the whole Bible works together is that you you if you if you pull the, the bad sections out and you go, oh, I'm just going to make my assessment based on this section alone without placing that section within the whole rest of the story, you're going to develop a negative opinion. So you ask the question, so how could, how could God even do this? Well, first, it sets it up as a test. This is a test for Abraham. But if you take everything that you know about God up until this point, one of the things that you will see is that God is working and moving through the midst of the story to bring about his purposes. The next thing is, if you just sort of, you know, look past, you know, okay, so I'm at Genesis 22, and oh, there's a whole rest of the book here. Maybe I should just keep reading, see what happens. And that's one of the problems that people have is they don't keep reading. Uh, anyway, so he tells, Isaac, he tells Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, the gospel writers pick up on this language. Three times in this passage, the author of Genesis uses that phrase. Your son, your only son, whom you love. This, you see this where Jesus' is baptism right? You see this. All of the Gospels use this language. It's right from the, the, the Torah. It's right from, from the Genesis account. And this is, go back to friendship. When you go back to friendship, you're like, okay. Jesus says, no longer do I call you servant, but I call you friend because a, a servant doesn't know his master's business. Do you see a parallel of what Abraham is being asked to do with what God will eventually do with his only begotten son? His son, his only son, whom he loves. Do you see a parallel here, 
Right, so Abraham, it, it sort of is, begins to emerge right here. That Abraham, if you're wondering, why is, he, why is he the friend? Because God would later give his only son as, as the atoning sacrifice for all of humanity. And here Abraham, his heart is going to match the heart of his friend. See that? A friend knows the heart of a friend, right? Knows what a friend is going to say. Knows what a friend is going to do. One, knows how the friend is going to say it. Mo, Abraham is being asked to do something that the friend will eventually do. So this is his test. Going on. So early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. This is um, verse three. He, he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place that God told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took, now that like, just think about what he just said. Did he, did he tell a lie? To his servants? Anybody? Yes? Some would say, yeah. I mean, from like knowing what he was asked to do, it seems like he just lied to his friends. But also, or to his servants, not his friends. But also, you could take this statement and, and sort of put it in a different perspective. That's, that Abraham's statement to his, his servants was that, hey guys, we're going to go over there and then we're going to come back. You could, you could interpret his, his phrase as a statement of faith. Like, I, we're going over there to worship and it's almost like he knows, like, but God's going to come through for me. God is, he's going to prove himself faithful. There's something that he's going to do that I don't know what he's going to do, but I can, I can, I can assure you we're coming back. So you could read that as a lie, but you could also read that as this is Abraham knowing and calling upon his friendship with God. That at this point in his life, he, he has had enough encounters and he knows God well enough, intimately enough, to know exactly how this thing's going to play out. So Abraham took the, the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said, Hey, Father Abraham. Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood is here, but where is the lamb for the offering? Right? So, What you see here is that like Isaac or Abraham and by the way people who think that like this is like the Bible is an endorsing you know child sacrifice it's not Isaac is well beyond being a child um, he's into his adult years at this point um, but uh, that's a, another that's just a rabbit hole anyway um, what you see is that if you, look, if you look at the story up until this point, there's a major source of contention in Abraham's life. And that source is whether or not he's going to have an heir. The Lord told him, you're going to have an heir. Right? Major, major points of the story really hinge around him having a son or a daughter or a son that would carry on his lineage. And so he's really nervous at, at this point about like, wait a second, I'm like being asked to take my, this is, this is my most prized possession, my household. This is my name. This is my, the nation that God said I was going to have. And he's asking me to sacrifice it. And he does. 
He goes really all the way up until the point of sacrificing Isaac. Meaning he's got the knife, Isaac's laying on the table, he's got the wood around him, and, and Abraham's got the knife in killing position. He's ready to go through with it. And all the while, I guarantee, he's, he's thinking about his friendship with God and God is somehow going to provide. Now, most of us, when we think about our friendship, we have limitations to our friendship, right? Yeah. Like, there's, there's things that if a friend asked you to do it, you'd do it, right? Like, if, I, if friend, you know, we're friends, and I show up and say, hey, can I have a dollar? You know, you give me a dollar, right? Right? And most of you, if you probably weren't my friend, you'd say, yeah, I'll still give you a dollar. I, I have enough compassion for you. But if I, you know, ask for $10 and you're like, okay, well, yeah, it's a little more, but I'll give a hundred dollars, you know, a thousand dollars, right? If your friend asked for a thousand dollars, how many of you would give them a thousand dollars? Anybody? Now that's where you start getting into the, well, that's a lot of money. $10,000, right? If your friend asked for your car, you say, oh yeah, you can borrow my car anytime you need it, you know, but uh, if they actually came to you and said, hey, can I have your car? I need a car. Can you give me you know, that car? That's a nice car. I really like your car. Some of you, I really like your car, right? Can you give me your car? Yeah? Can, can you give me your car? Like, I really like your car. I really like your car. Like, you have a really, really cool car. Um, and you go, no, we're friends, but no, I'm not going to do that, right? And that's, the, that's the, the, the underlying truth about our friendships is that we sort of have these, you know, self-imposed limits of like what we will do for our friend. Yeah, call me at two o'clock in the morning anytime you like or anytime you need and I'll come rescue you. But, you know, not four. Like, definitely not four. <laughs> Abraham here was demonstrating that with his relationship with God, with his friendship with God, he had no limit. There was no, there was no thing in his life that God could not ask for that he would not give him. And this is what friends do. This is, as James actually says, the book of James, if you go to the book of James chapter 2, says, was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did? Get this, when he offered. Most people think um, Hebrews 11 actually says that Abraham believed God and God credited to him as righteousness. And most people look at Abraham as, as a righteous person because of his belief in God. But James actually says something different. That James says that it was when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. It was when he, he said, okay, God, you asked for him. I'm going to give him to you. That was the thing that proved his righteousness and his faith and his belief and his ultimate trust in God. James goes on to say, you see that this faith in his actions, right? So it was his belief in his action, his raising of the knife that were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he, for this reason, was called the friend of God. So not only do we see in Abraham's life that God is working on him as an individual and he is intimately connected and he's listening and he's obeying and he's worshiping and he's giving a, a tenth of all of he owns, but he basically has this posture later on in his life that says, God, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to give it to you. My life is, is just an open hand to you, Lord. Take whatever you want from me. I freely give to you. Take my whole life. You, you, want, you want my legacy, God? You can have my legacy. Take it. It's yours. He held nothing back from him. And friends do this with God. Friends of God are prepared to say, God, whatever, whatever the ask, whatever the ask, whatever you want from my life, I will give it to you. It's yours. And that sometimes comes off as a, as a very radical sort of existence. And it is a, it is a radical existence. I, um, history, church history, is filled with people who lived this sort of radical existence. Uh, some people that you might want to look at is uh, like Hudson Taylor. You guys know Hudson Taylor? Ever read anything by Hudson Taylor? Hudson Taylor is a, is a first 
uh, missionary in the late 19th century, was the first missionary into China. Um, and uh, he would, uh, he just this, lived this just type of radical existence where he would begin to set things in motion that he didn't have the money to pay for or the people to, to do. And, and it, it's wild. And he starts praying for things. Like he records in his journal, like I'm praying for this and we're gonna start doing this. And it's like, then uh, he gets a letter in the mail several months later and it's like somebody that sends him, you know, the equivalent of like $50,000 and say, hey, I'm paying for this thing for you. And the letter was postdated two months before he, he prayed in his journal. He wrote it in his prayer journal. Like, what? Like crazy stuff, crazy provision. It's radical. Another guy was George Mueller. I don't know if you ever read anything about George Mueller. He's a phenomenal uh, figure in church history. Uh, he, would, he had a, an orphanage in, uh, in England in the, the early 20th century. And uh, he would, had no food, no food to give his kids. And one of the things that he would do is he would tell them, okay, we're going we're gonna to set all the tables. We're going to prepare for dinner. And we're going to, we don't have any food to give, but we're going to do it anyway. And we're going to just, you know, pray and ask the Lord to bless our meal and believe for his provision. And so that's what they would do. He'd get all these kids together. They'd set the tables and they'd sit down and they'd kneel and they'd pray. And in the midst of their prayer, people would bang on the door and say, we've got food for you. In 2004, I was with a friend, Heidi Baker in Mozambique. And uh, we, had a, we had a few chickens and we had to feed a thousand people. And Heidi, I was like, this is crazy. Heidi goes, let's just cook the chicken and the rice and see what happens. I'm like, um, I can tell you what's going to happen. This is me, my analytical thinking. I can tell you what's going to happen. We're going to run out of food. That's what's going to happen. And she goes, no, 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 our Father will provide. It'll be great. And that's, that's just exactly how she said it. And so they cooked, the, she, her, her cooks, they killed the chickens. They kept frying, they, they fried them up and they cooked the rice. And they served it over a thousand people. My mind was blown. Like, what? How, like, they just, they kept pulling chicken out of the fry. Like, I just, I don't even know how it happened, but it just was like crazy. In 2009, I was with a, a mission team in Honduras, and we were through this fiesta. And uh, uh, afterwards, um, you know, we cooked, we had chicken and tortillas and rice and all stuff for this big party we were throwing. And afterwards, this uh, young lady on our team comes up to me. I call her the bean counter. Uh, she's so analytical, such a, like, straight bean counter, um, comes up to me afterwards and goes, um, I counted 787 plates. I said, okay, great, awesome, you know, cool. And uh, she goes, no, 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 I counted 787 plates. All right, cool, great. And she goes, no, I counted 787 plates. And to this point, she's getting mad at me. Like, I'm just totally like, you know, chill, as I always am. I'm like, yeah, cool, whatever. Like, okay. And, um, and she goes, no, we had, we had 300 plates. We had 300 cups. We had 300 tortillas. And I counted 787. I don't know what happened. And I was like, yeah, I don't know how that works. Like the whole food multiplication thing? I don't know how that works. But you know what? I know how faith works. And, and I know that, that friends of God, they, they put themselves in positions to, to see radical provision from God. And that's what happens. I, I, don't, I can't tell you how it works. I can't tell you the, the metaphysics of the whole thing. I, like... And that's what she's wanting to know. Like she was, a, she was a physicist. And she's like, I want to know the metaphysics of it all. Like how did it work? And I'm like, I don't know how it works. I just know that people who call God friend know the heart of their friend. And they live in a, in a way 
that positions them to see the radical provision of their friend. And that's what Abraham does. In verse 9, he says, when they reached the place that God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there, arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out of his hand, he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord in that moment called to him and said, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham says, here I am. Abraham, do not lay a hand on the boy. He said, do not lay anything on him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld anything from me, even your son, your only son, whom you love. And Abraham looked up And there in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. When he went over, he took the ram and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide uh, Jehovah Jireh. And to say, and to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. So friendship Friendship with God is just it's living your life in such a radical posture. It's not, God, it's not that God's going to call you to sacrifice your, your children. It's not, that's, that doesn't happen. Actually, the prophets sort of speak against that whole sort of thing. Um, call it detestable. The detestable practices of the nations around you is what they call it. God's not asking you to do that. What he is, he is if you're looking for friendship with God, what he is looking for in your life is that you have no limits with him. You have, you have, you know, God, you, you don't have a, God, you can have this and you can have this area and you can have this area, but all of this stuff over here, all of that, no, you can't have that. That's, that's mine. That's my legacy. That's my, that's, that's, that's my seed, You can't have that. Friendship with God is saying, you know what? You can have the whole thing. It's all yours. It's it's not mine. It's like, I'm sure Abraham at some point probably said, you know what? God gave me the son. He can give me another one. Actually, that's what Hebrews says. You know, Hebrews says that that, uh, Abraham believed God. Abraham in, in Hebrews 11 is mentioned twice. The first time it says that Abraham believed God and God credited to him his righteousness. But the second time it says, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. And this is, this is like a commentary. By, so you know, Hebrews is like a commentary on the, the Torah. He says, uh, his... The promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. But Abraham, get this, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. So Abraham here by the author of Hebrews is saying, look, Abraham approached the situation not, so when he talks to his servants, he didn't lie to them. The the author of Hebrews actually looks at his statement as this is his faith in action. He told his servants what he was going to see. He knew that God was going to provide for them. He knew it. He went into that whole situation going, you know what? God has, has, has been upon my life. His hand has been upon my life up until this point. He's not going to let me down now. I know this. And he, it's like he walked into the situation. You know what? Even if, even if this does happen this way, I, God's going to raise the dead. He's going to raise my son back to life. But it wasn't. I, Abraham's son, that he would raise back to life. It was his own son. That's fun? That's fun. Friends of God, lastly, friends of God, they find the miraculous fulfillment of every need in their friend's work. Abraham saw himself as part of the, uh, the big story that God was doing in the earth. Your life is a part of the big story that God is, is, is playing out throughout history. And his friends are the ones that say, God, I, all of it is to you and to your glory, not mine. 
That's the friendship that he offers us. Is that every aspect of our lives can be to glorify him and play into his story. Let's stand. I, I, in closing, I just want to kind of give you a, an invitation that um, you want to see, if you want to see God move in your midst, you want to see God move in your life and your heart and in your family and in your circumstance and your job and your career, in the trajectory that your life is on, if you want to see a radical change and you want to see God, God's hand and his provision upon you, even if you want to see the things, like Lord, like this was one of my prayers early on as a young person. God, I want to see the things that you did in the Bible. I want, you to, I want to see those in my life. And at, at some point, I had to, to realize that in order to enter into that, that realm of friendship, I had to break down the barriers of the things in my life that I was keeping God from. And so I want to offer that invitation to you that, that if you really want to see God move in your life, say, Lord, there's no part of my life that you can't have. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live my life truly, Lord, with an open hand to you. And I, I got to caution you. you. If you ask God, you give him permission to do it. He's going to do it. You're, you're going to be sitting in your cubicle tomorrow and the Lord is going to say, hey, you know, you're overhearing this conversation about this problem in this person's life. Uh, you're going to hear the voice of the Lord say, why don't you get up and go pray for them? He's going to invite you to do things that are like living with the knife in your hand. Like it's like this radical existence where it's like, oh God, I don't know if I can do that. But when you start to live that way, when you start to live in a way where it's like, God, oh, whatever, whatever it is, whatever you want, whatever you ask me to do, I'm going to do. We start to see God moving in our midst. We begin to see his radical provision. We begin to see his, his healing touch upon the people's lives around us. So I give you that invitation. Just say, Lord, use my life. Everything that I have, everything that I own, it's all yours. My kids, they're yours. My house, it's yours. My job, it's yours. It's all yours. Lord, would you come and have your way with us? We invite you, God. And if you're here today and you haven't even entered into the, like the, the realm of possibility of being a friend of God, like they're just sort of like keeping God at arm's length. I can, I just I want to ask you just to lower your arm and let God come close. And just say, Jesus, I, I want to be your friend. I want to feel your love. I want to feel your care. As a, as a friend cares for a friend, Lord Jesus, I want you to care for me. We thank you, God, for your, your offer of friendship. We bless you. We ask, God, that you'd bless us this week. In Jesus' name, amen.